Welcome back to the Managed to Win podcast. Today we're talking with Neil Hennessy. He's uh, chairman of the board of Hennessy Advisors and Hennessy Funds. Neil, thanks for joining us. Hey, thank you. I appreciate it, Jeff. Neil, can you go into your background for us uh, and for our audience? Sure. Um, you know, I was lucky at the age of 23, uh, Jeff, to be hired into the business with Payne Weber. Uh, and I was with Payne Weber as a retail broker for two and a half years till I had the opportunity back in uh, 82 to join a company called Hamburg and Quist, which at that time was a premier broker dealer slash venture capitalist on the world. And I was with them for a year and a half and then Payne Weber at the age of 27 wanted to hire me back into management and I would have been one of the youngest, if not the youngest manager they ever hired at Payne Weber. Bill Hambrick told me, you gotta do it, you're 27, you're gonna learn a lot. So I went back to Payne Weber and I ran a couple of different branches for him, then became a divisional sales manager, one of many covering 10 Western states and 36 offices, which Jeff meant you got on a plane on a Monday night, came home on a Thursday night, say so had Monday and Friday in the office and God knows where you had to be on the weekend. And during that time frame, you know, I also sat on the NASD District Business Conduct Committee. I was elected to that when I was uh, 29 years old, the youngest in, in, in the nation for that position. And that really was, we were to judge, jury, and executioner of anybody in the industry, be it a firm or a broker or a broker-dealer that ran afoul of the rules and regulations of the industry. And so in 89, February of 89, I thought, I had enough intelligence to start my own broker dealer and go out on my own. And, and that's essentially what I did. And I, I went out um, and started my company in 1989. And we can go from there. If you want me to keep going, I can go. But that's essentially up to the point of when I started Hennessy Advisors. Hey, well, Neil, why don't you explain, you know, what, what Hennessy Advisors and Hennessy Fund is, is for us? Because, and this is really fun for me, Neil, because... Yeah, as, as I, I hope you remember. I mean, we went to middle school together, high school. Uh, for our audience, uh, Neil was always a very confident guy, great athlete, got along with virtually everybody, a great basketball player. And then we diverged um, at college time. So I don't know, you know, where you went to college, what that was like, but um, it's, it's great to connect again. I mean, we've been together a little bit in the, in the community. Right. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to have you on the podcast today. So maybe give us a little more information on what you're doing now. Yeah, well, thanks. I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to get a full basketball scholarship at the University of San Diego, uh, of which now it looks like I swallowed the basketball. But that's a different story. <laughs> but, you know, it, it was a, a, a lot of fun. And, and then I had the opportunity to get into this business that I really wanted to be in since I was a kid. My dad was a stockbroker. It was always somewhat in my blood, apparently. And, and so I, I, I had the opportunity to get in, into the business. You know, it's, it's funny, when I started the company, uh, it was interesting because I had saved all the money, Dave, you know, for uh, the payoff our house so we didn't have any debt. But being the genius that I am, I decided I'd use that money to start the company and I prom promptly lost all that money. And then I went and uh, through my retirement funds. And then I went through a second on the house. And I'll never forget my wife, Kathy, of what we were just discussing of 40 years. She asked me one night and she said, Neil, do you know when to say when? And I said, yes. When I wake up in the morning, I hope and pray that this works. I will shut it down immediately. And thank God we never got there. But, you know, when we were um, first starting out and trying to get clients there, it was very difficult because when you start a company, Dave, as, as you well know, Unless you have your shingle out for five years, people just don't flock to you. They just don't trust you. Are you going to be here today or are you not going to be here? And so the first five years are very difficult. The second five years, you actually start to produce an income for yourself if you can survive the first five years. And then after 10 years, you start to build net worth. And then after uh, 15 years, you actually start to uh, build an estate. And, and so it sort of goes in five, five year circle. Uh, cycles as uh, at least it did for me but i've seen other businesses go through the same trials and tribulations yeah well but you're also in a challenging business because it's not only what's happening in the business and potentially the economy but the ups and downs of the stock market and a lot of people in our audience probably don't realize 
I mean, uh, smart people like yourself make money in a down market as well as in an up market. But, you know, it's, it's not easy to do that. You learn that over time. Uh, you may not know it. I spent five years on the floor of the Pacific Stock Exchange. Right. Yeah, I went out of college and quit Berkeley early and, and did that. So I have a little bit of an understanding of, you know, what you're doing. But I respect it. I mean, it's, you're in a tough biz. Well, actually, I'm not in a tough business. Um, you know, I've been in this business 40 years come September. And I've never had a customer complaint or a lawsuit. And that's being a broker or a manager, or a divisional sales manager, or a broker dealer, RIA, you name it. Because we've never played in the gray area. If you don't play in the gray area, you don't have to really worry too too much. The other thing is the, if you buy quality and, and you hold on to quality and, and you stick with quality principles when you're investing and you don't let the emotions get the better of you, you're going to be fine through good and bad markets. I know that you know since 2010, everybody's been asking me, "Are we? is this market long in the tooth? Is it over? And everybody keeps coming up and we recycle, Dave all the same headlines. Is it the tariffs? Is it taxes? Is it, you know, whatever the headline, we just keep uh, uh, cycling them. But the reality of the situation is, is, you know, since 2010, we've had fifth, uh, 10, we've had 15 corrections, excuse me, between five and 10%. And they bounce back very, very quickly to market. We've had six between 10 and 20% was the worst being the fourth quarter last year, which was down 19.6%, but we bounced all the way back, you know? And, and so what's happening is people want to get out of the market and get in the market, but there's no time. If you buy quality, you hang on to it and you stick with your principles, you'll be fine through good and bad markets. It's just not every day that the market's going to go up. And so what's the difference between Hennessy Funds, Hennessy Advisors? Well, Hennessy Advisors is, is the publicly traded asset manager that manages the money for our 16 mutual funds. To give you an idea, Dave, of what happened and why we went public is back in uh, the 90s, uh, it was difficult to get clients. And somehow, some way, because of my background as a broker, as a manager, as a divisional sales manager, in my six, seven years with the NASD District Business Conduct Committee, I somehow got involved in expert witnessing for the securities industry. And I was involved in over 500 expert witnessing cases for the industry and only industry specific uh, um, issues. And that kept the doors open. And then in 2000, and my, then in 1996, I started my first mutual fund. Then two years later, I started my second mutual fund. And then two years later in 2000, I bought my first couple of mutual funds, the O'Shaughnessy funds. And that gave me four quantitatively traded or managed mutual funds. Then two years later, I took the company public, just like a small community bank. We're, we have friends and family and people in the community. We sold stock to, and we paid off the $5 million in debt. We had a million dollars in cash for uh, future growth and acquisitions. And we went on our way. So we've been uh, uh, public since um, I think May of 2002, and you know we've been paying a dividend for 15 years, and you know 13 dividend increases. So during the time frame, we told our shareholders what we we're trying to do is is grow organically through purchases uh, of people purchasing our mutual funds and asset growth uh, through appreciation but also through acquisition. So we've made 10 acquisitions in, in the time period with 30 mutual funds, and we're continuing to look for acquisitions out there in today's world. When you do those acquisitions, do you acquire people as well as the, the fund assets? Normally, no. Uh, the one transaction that we did do that with was FBR because part of the, the uh, criteria was they wanted us, whoever was going to win the bid, they wanted us to take the 10 employees, 11 employees for at least a year, guaranteeing what they made the year before and things of that sort. That was the only time. And it worked out very well because we were able to keep who we wanted out of those 10 people. We were able to keep Brian and, 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 and uh, Dave Ellison and Darcy. And, and so that transaction worked very well. But normally, we don't. We just acquire They're called asset purchase agreements. 
And there's a big difference of why we do that. I don't want to buy the RIA. I don't want to buy the company, Dave. And the reason I don't want to buy it is because I don't want the unforeseen liabilities that come with buying a company. If I buy the management contract, I'm not, I'm not taking any, any, to any degree, any risk of, of getting sued in the future. Yeah. So when I'm working with clients, I, I do a similar recommendation. I say you do asset only purchases. Right. Yeah. You don't, you don't want the company because there's always unknowns. Right. Yeah. But in the mutual fund industry, those are, you know, very, very, very small as to is a mutual fund itself going to be dirty. It's pretty tough to be dirty in, in, in the mutual fund industry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jeff, I, I'm sorry. I was just commandeering a little bit. Do you have some things you wanted to chime in with bef before I keep going here? And oh, no, it's fine. Uh, Neil, you mentioned some of the startup costs for uh, launching your business. So I was wondering if there are any other challenges that you and you encountered during that time. <laughs> <laughs> Any other challenges? <laughs> Every day is a challenge. Um, but, you know, I, I, I guess what it is, one of the secrets, to be honest with you, and I don't normally tell many people this, but when I was first started, uh, uh, Jeff, it was one of those things people would ask me, you know, uh, how's business? And I go, God, it's slow. You know, I've been in the business 10 years. I just can't get the assets people aren't bringing you know, coming in or anything. And, and the more I talked about that, the less business I got. And then it was one day somebody asked me, said, how's business? And I said, it's absolutely awesome. I'm swamped. And I was, I was watching General Hospital, but I was swamped, <laughs> you know, and, and this is a true story. The more I said that I was swamped and that I was busy, people wanted to meet with me. And it's very, very funny how that worked. But they were looking for somebody that was busy because if you're busy, then obviously you must be good, supposedly. And so the more I said that, the more clients we got, the more assets we got. Because you got to remember when we started, I came out of management and, you know, in our first office, we had no clients, we had no assets, we had no heat and we had no air conditioning. So when you talk about starting with nothing, that's where we came from. And today we manage 16 mutual funds and $5 billion. But it's, you know, every day something new comes along, especially in the regulatory environment that we were in under the previous administration, not so much the, the present administration, but everybody, when you're looking at a public company, I call it like a three headed dragon. I mean, you got the regulators, the legislators and the PCAOB, everybody wants to have a piece. They all want to have a say, they all want to put new rules and regulations in. It's sort of like, how productive is Congress is measured by how many laws they put on the books. I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me, but that's how Congress is measured. And, and um, you know, every, the, the regulatory agencies and legislation uh, and, and the PCAOB, they all want a piece. They all want to put new rules in or however they want to do it. So it is, it is difficult on a daily basis, let alone, as you know, and, and uh, Dave, facing, you know, this new cybersecurity uh, situation for all companies. Yeah, the whole cybersecurity thing and what's going on there is, is a huge space with a lot of our clients. Um, I was just taking a note on something you said. And um, that's, a, that's a huge challenge for your people because, you know, on the one hand, you've got to have this, this super sophisticated um, yet unobtrusive cybersecurity protecting what you're doing. And on the other hand, you know, if you look at where the failures happen, they happen with people. It's, it's not usually the, te the technology. And for a lot of organizations, not just in your world, but in across the realm of all business and even nonprofit and government, um, there's not enough training of the people. Uh, you know, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, uh, Dave wholeheartedly, our general counsel and uh, assistant general counsel and compliance and everything here, we instituted, you know, started to come up with this a year and a half ago, two years ago, putting procedures and policy in place. But, you know, it's, it's, so I was just reading an article yesterday and we're talking about companies should be fishing for their own employees. Well, we've been doing this for a while about fishing and just trying to make sure that people just don't open something 
on their computer that then lets a virus in, that then lets them into our clients' portfolios or whatever. So we've been doing this training for a long time, well before the SEC really started to mandate it. Um, knock on wood that we've been successful, but we also have very, very good partners when you look at U.S. Bank, who custodians all of our clients' assets. So they have the policies and procedures and technology to protect our clientele, but then we have to overlie that, you know, with our own policies and procedures. And you're correct, it is people and you have to train the people just not to, to, to open these things up. Now, if you get caught and you open them up, then you got to go through training again. And, and so, you know, it's happened to me once, only once. Now I just don't open anything. I delete it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, and, and I've heard, and we've had really good experience with Bank of Marin too locally. Um, but the, the thing in the last two, three years or so that's been pretty amazing is when we talk about somebody opening something, we think of a staffer, a staff employee, and you just indicated you might have clicked on something. Right. But we have um, an increasing amount of situations that are happening with our partners, with their clients, where, you know, somebody's getting in and they're just sitting there and studying the flow of communication in the organization. Mm -hmm. And there were, um, there were two, three, at least three situations, two um, where the, the hacker got in, studied the communication and sent an email to somebody saying, okay, send this wire. Mm -hmm. And they had worded it so properly and everything that the person did it. And it was like $400,000, not yeah. a small amount of change. There was another one where the hacker sent the wire from supposedly the president to the CFO, mm -hmm. or maybe it was C CEO to CFO, and said, hey, you know, get this wire out for 125000 blah, 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 you know, kind of a casual conversation like they normally have. And um, the guy was busy. The CFO was busy. And what happened was the CEO was the um, – CEO was walking through the office and he, and he said, Hey, how's it going? And, and the CFO said, fine. And by the way, I'll get your wire out in about five minutes. And the CEO goes, what wire? Exactly. <laughs> and it was just, they were fortunate enough with the timing where they caught it, you know, but it's most people it's, I'm, I'm impressed. It sounds like you have a regular discipline with your people where you're doing your, maybe it's your background with that NASD experience where you're doing regular compliance type of training well yeah especially you know when you come to management uh, you know I, i'm not a cpa um you know i i know the books i understand it but if somebody's cooking the books you know am i going to be able to pick it up hopefully our auditors do you know if our, our uh, cfo's doing something like that or stealing or whatever but interesting enough there's just simple techniques that you can do so, for instance, I'll look and they say, I have this much money in a bank. So, I call up U.S. Bank. I go, how much is in my account? Or I'll call Bank of Marin. Or I'll call West America. I'll say, how much is in the account? And they tell me. I go, okay. Well, that's the same number that they gave me on the sheet of paper. So, that gives me comfort. I'm not sure what, where all the, the, the different expenses go within the different lines and, and for tax purposes. But I have a handle on where, where my cash is and what it should be on a daily basis. And that's important for everybody to really understand and look at. And especially, you know, even a small business or personally, you know, you might pay your bills online, you know, but you still should be checking your account, you know, a couple of times a week to make sure that you know how much cash you have in that account. And if you're missing 50000 you go, well, where'd that go? Yeah. So they're just simple things and it's logic and common sense, but it doesn't mean you can't get hit in this, in this cybersecurity world. But if, if you're vigilant and, and you're keeping your eye on the ball, you should be okay, or at least catch it really quick. Yeah. About 10 years ago, I had a $7,300 charge in Japan on my credit card. And fortunately I was doing what you're saying. I, you know, I was checking once or twice a week just kind of monitoring things. So I got to him within a day or two. And I said, I haven't even been to Japan. What are you talking about? <laughs> so they canceled yeah. it out. Well, Neil, I, I wanted to uh, ask one of the questions that, that we had lined up here for you. And that was uh, 
to describe some of the people that, that uh, or describe your hiring strategy when you're hiring someone for your business. It's a little bit different than some of the people in our audience. You know, a lot of our audience is from the IT sector, but uh, you know, I imagine you have to be quite particular about the type of people you hire to manage uh, a mutual fund. Well, uh, Jeff, let me just back up uh, and explain that there's 19 of us at the company. And with those 19 people, we manage, you know, 16 mutual funds, $5 billion, 300,000 shareholders in a publicly traded company with 19 people. And interesting enough, the way it's worked is we can do that because we never have a job opening at, at our company. But if the right person walks through the door, we got a job opening. And so we never look out to fill a position or do something like that. We've been fortunate, for instance, uh, Tanya Kelly, who's head of marketing uh, for us and has been for 15 years, was head of marketing for Comcast for Northern California. And she happened to invest in the IPO back in 2002. And she had gone to uh, high school with Terry and knew Terry. And came in and said, you know, would you guys um, think about hiring somebody on the marketing side? And of course, she was qualified and smart. And so, yeah, we hired Tanya right then and there. We've had a general counsel, the same type of thing. She was back uh, helping taking us public back in 2002, was with a law firm and got married and moved to Austin, Texas. And she said, well, have you guys thought about having in-house counsel? Same way with distribution. So we've been very, very fortunate that we, we don't go out and look for people. People have found us. That, that's number one. And, and I think one of the reasons they come find us is because we're small, we have to distinguish ourselves versus everybody else. And when I say that, you know, we're just a mutual fund, but we're up against the Franklins of the world. We're up against the Vanguards of the world. We're up against the t Road prices, uh, you know, um, all these companies and we all have to play by the same rules, but what distinguishes us versus say a Vanguard? Well, I would say number one is customer service. We don't have voicemail here. It was absolute conscious decision. I want the phone answered here in the first two rings and, and, and Dave and, and, and Jeff, you phoned in and you know that you get a real life person. It's not push one here or two here or whatever. You get a real life person, we try and take care of that situation, whatever your problem is, promptly. And that means all of us have to be trained in what we do so that it could be the compliance answering the phone, it could be general counsel, it could be the accounting department, it could be myself, anything. So all of our people talk to our shareholders, which sets us apart because I wanted everybody here to understand who's paying us and, and we have to service them. That is something that you don't hear about in the industry. And that's why you look at a, a Vanguard and, and they've had some technical problems, some service problems recently, but we just keep doing what we do and how we do it. So we're still the old fashioned. We still wear suit and ties to the office every day with the exception of Fridays. It's, it's business casual, but every day we're in suit and ties and, and, and nice, uh, um, nice clothing. I'm not sure how you politically say women's clothing, but everybody is dressed for business in here on a daily basis, which sets us apart. And I travel, you know, New York, Chicago, Boston, Japan, China, and go all over. And nobody's wearing ties anymore in, in suits, but this sets us apart. And so just little things like that are just handwritten notes. We still, when somebody opens an account, have a handwritten note sent out. And so, you know, over time, it takes time, but over time, you, you get loyalty and you get people that then want to come and work for the company. You know, we have a client that uh, took a similar approach with um, only answering the phones. And again, I think it was two rings yeah. and um, they just felt it just set them apart. And particularly, you know, in that MSP space, managed service provider for IT services, mm -hmm. you know, it's all technology folks. And the natural thing is it goes into a voicemail prompt type of thing. And when you're frustrated with your computer to call and actually have a human pickup, 
it, it makes it, it, they really felt it made a difference. Yeah, it does. I mean, another thing that's set us apart, but I learned this early on, uh, Dave, from uh, my boss, Jim Klein. He, he told me, never work a Friday afternoon. Now, you can work Saturday and Sunday, but never work a Friday afternoon. And this is why we close at 2 o'clock Pacific Coast time on, on Fridays, is because typically what happens is in the afternoon, you're just going to get a problem. Somebody wants it off their desk, so they're going to give you a problem so that you can take care of it and, instead of them taking care of it. So nothing good really in the real world happens after midnight. In the business world, nothing really good happens after 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So you're better off just shutting <laughs> it down. And, and, and I do work a lot of Saturdays and Sundays, but I will not work a Friday afternoon. <laughs> I think that's great. It sounds like you've you've committed to quality in your business, and and people just come to you when you need it. I, I'm I'm curious about the suit and tie thing. Is that that's coming from you, obviously, right? Right. Well, you know, I I've always worn a suit and tie to the work, and then we try to to um, say, okay, well, we'll just do business casual. That was what was happening, and we went tried it for a year, but we just weren't bringing in the assets. And I said, that's enough of that. We're going back to suit and tie. Because essentially, if you really look at it, if somebody has a million dollars or $5 million, do they really want to sit across from somebody in, in, in a golf shirt and, and say, you know, I'll, I'll take care of your money. I'll be right there. But, you know, I got a two o'clock tee off, so we got to hustle. But, it, you know, I might have a two o'clock tee off, but I still got my suit and tie on. So it, it, it's just a comfort level. Plus, the, in all seriousness, I've, I've always believed that when you – you leave the office, you leave the work at the office, you leave it there and you go home and you go home and you change out of your business suit into your, into your uh, casual clothes and it's a different lifestyle. So you, it would mentally, it, you leave work behind. If you need the work come into the office, I know some people work from their homes and, and they have emails on their phones. I don't and I'd rather not. So that's why, you know, if I'm going to work, I'm going to come to the office. Once I leave, I'm out of here. The different mind thought. Yeah, I think my experience has been similar, and also some studies that I've read that that there is a certain percentage, and I don't remember the percentage of people that if you put them in a suit and a tie or a uniform of some sort, they work at a higher level than they do otherwise in other clothing. So it actually makes a difference in in how they engage in in the workplace. Well, it's interesting. You can't buy the book anymore, and it's very, very tough to find. But there is a book that, that we, all of our us rookies had to read when we were first in the business, Dress for Success. And you can't yeah, find the book I anymore. remember that one. Yeah. That was, that was a big book, Dress for Success. <laughs> yeah. I need to change my, change my work outfits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, Neil, what's, this leads in perfectly to uh, one of the other questions we had was about your style of leadership. What do you think, how do you manage? Is it, uh, are you a micromanager or do you like to take a macro view and hands-off approach? Well, I'm pretty much, I'm pretty much at the 30,000 foot level. I mean, if you hire competent people and good people, you just let them do it, you know, and, they, and what I've learned over the years is you hire people smarter than yourself. And I know a lot of people say that. But the, the, I've been fortunate to be able to work with everybody that's really smarter than myself. And they can also multitask. And that's a very difficult trait to do when you multitask. When you look at, for instance, my office, in this office, we have, I don't know, 12 people working in this office uh, physically out of this location. And the office is 14,000 square feet. And you go, that's just crazy. But there was... There was logic behind why we did that. Number one, the dollars were the same for 14,000 square feet for better office space than the 8,000 square feet we were looking at. So dollar for dollar, it was the same. It didn't really matter because we were only looking back, I guess, uh, 13 years ago for uh, 8,000 square feet. So we had room to grow. Should we, should we want to grow here with 14,000? Second thing I learned is if you have people that have, are multi-talented and can multitask, they need oversized offices. And the reason being is then people can go into the office, they can discuss the idea, whatever, make a decision and go on. When I was managing at Payne Weber, I learned uh, very quickly that we had small office space 
everybody was condensed and you had a bullpen where everybody was like in the cubicles. If you wanted to have a meeting, you went to the conference room. And what I realized there, when people go to a conference room, they go for the duration. They get their coffee and they get this and that and they go to the conference room. They're not there to make a quick decision. And so when you have oversized offices, you can get people in, make the decision and move on. The other thing about it is when you have only 11 or 12 people that are working out of this office of 14,000 square feet, you can't really uh, you know, afford people to go out to lunch all the time because how are you gonna staff it when the phone's ringing? And essentially though, if, if I leave my, uh, my office to go down to the reception desk, it's like I left the office. So, or, or to go to the, the men's room, it's like I left the office because you know you got to cover 14,000 square feet to get and back. So you're relaxed. The other thing we've been in here now, and uh, if you come by and see the office, like I say, it's 13 years and, and uh, we've never had a paint and we've never had to re, um, uh, redo the carpet because there's, the traffic isn't the same the whole way. The reason we don't have to paint is because it's open, it's wide, it's not a small hallway where you bump into it all the time. So when you start to look at uh, how we did it and looked outside the board, thank God backed me on it, but that, that's the real success of what we do here. You're talking about we do over $2 million in revenue per employee. And, th and that's a, a large number for any industry, let alone ours. Yeah, I like, what you, I like what you said earlier, too, that um, people come to you. And so uh, we, we teach uh, hiring system, hire the best. We work on that with our clients and implementing that because most, most of our clients are not, um, they're, they're not systematic in the way they hire people. So we work on that. And one of the, things we, the points we make is that if you also work on your company, you can be a magnet for talent. So, you know, the good companies have good people coming to them. They don't have to fight for them, advertise for them, hire recruiters. And you've taken a similar approach by being very um, true to your company values, true to the way you invest. And, uh, you know, you've developed some trust probably in a marketplace that, you know, attracts people. They feel like it's, it's a good opportunity to come and work with you. It's a safe place and um, a place where they can prosper. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, it's I keep going back to thinking outside the box, trying to distinguish yourself versus everybody else. I remember back in 2002, we did not have the money to hire a sales force or to go out and wholesale our products to uh, to the nation. We just didn't have the capital to do it. So we decided decided at that, that time that we would hire hire a PR firm to market us to the media. And the concept behind it was, okay, it's one person, it's an outside firm, they, they market us to the media. And if, if a reporter from Barron's or the Wall Street Journal or IVD or whatever wrote an article about one of our funds, it was like a third party endorsement. Yeah. And so between that, then it rolled the TV and it went to this and that. So now you look back since 2002 and you're looking 16 years later, 17 years later, You'll see the Hennessy name. We're just a small little company in, in Nevada, California, although we're the largest mutual fund company on Redwood Boulevard in Nevada. With that said, you will see the Hennessy name once every two, two and a half days, national radio, TV, or print. And we continue to cover it. And, and that makes us look a lot larger than we are, but it gets our story out at the same time, too. Yeah, well, it also helps that you have a good return on your investments. Thank you. If you weren't, I mean, I'm, I'm in general not a big fan of mutual funds because so many of them don't offer a return. One of the things that impressed me so much is that you've had such a good consistent rate of return. Well, you know, it's, it's, I, I appreciate um, your, your, uh, your thoughts and, and everything. We've been fortunate because you, you can only, if you look at the big deal now is index funds. Well, if you're going to buy the S&P 500, you're not going to have all 500 companies are not going to be good companies. <laughs> so what you're trying to do is buy the good companies. And you don't need more than 20 or 30 companies in a portfolio. Now, if the, the, low, the, the smaller the companies, the more diversification you need because there's a little more risky. So, I mean, our largest uh, position portfolio, portfolio would be a small cap that has, uh, in Japan, has, you know, 50 to 60 companies in it. But other than that, 
they're all between 20 and 30 companies and stocks. And, and that's where you get what people call alpha, but that's where you get the returns over time is because you're trying to buy quality and, 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 and not the whole market. Buying the market's good on an up market. It is terrible for you in a down sideways or volatile market. That's when the investor gets crushed. And that's where active management takes over. And that's what we are. Well, and I think too, um, I, I think you've got seasoned people. And also when you're investing in 20, 30 companies, you can really know them. You know, I, I think I, I always remember my grandfather when I was young, gave me a little book called The Richest Man in Babylon. I don't know whether you've ever seen that. But the Never concept- been to Babylon. Yeah. <laughs> so the concept was of the book, it's a great little book, is that, you know, this young guy says, oh, I want to become rich. So he goes and meets with the richest man in Babylon. And the, the richest man in Babylon teaches him, okay, well, the first thing you do is you set aside 10% of everything you earn so you can invest that. And then you invest that. Well, the first thing he invests in is a buddy of his says, oh, we're going to go buy diamonds. I'll make a, you know, a ton of money. Well, they lose all that money. So he goes back to the richest man in Babylon and says, well, you know, what, uh, what, what went wrong? I did what you said. He said, well, you only invest in things you understand. Mm -hmm. And so when you're investing in 20, 30 companies, you can do that. You can really understand the companies. You understand what they're doing, what their growth patterns are, how they grow. When you go do the S&P 500, as you said, you know, they're not all good companies. And you really can't understand all those industries and what's going on in them. Right. So, so it's, 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 it's a different take on, I got into this business because I loved it, but then what I love most about this business is I love making people money. I mean, I, I, I really do. If, if you make people money, they like you. <laughs> very simple, but um, you know, and, and you don't have to complicate it. It's, you know, it's a very simple, you know, the old kiss philosophy, keep it simple, stupid. I mean, it's, it's not rocket science that what we do, but it's perceived as you got to be really smart. It's perceived that you have to be really smart to be on TV. That's not true because I'm, I'm living proof of that, but essentially <laughs> What we try and do here is using common sense and logic. And, and like I tell reporters and I tell uh, anchors that, look, I'm not an economist. I'm not an analyst. What I am is an economic realist. And in a real, I'll give you a, a classic lately that I've been on because everybody's now talking about a recession. There's a recession around the corner. Like I say, I'm not an economist or an analyst. An economic realist will understand that you can't have a recession when everybody's employed. The United States isn't a, isn't a country of savers. It's a country of spenders. Japan is a country of savers, not spenders. So essentially, you can't have it. Now, the economist that's teaching in, in a lecture hall in college is going to tell you everything, but they're not out in the real world. And this, the real world is, you know, you can't have a recession when everybody's, uh, you know, employed. So think of things logically and in a common sense way and you'll be fine long-term. Tying into that, uh, I'll, I'm, I want to read off the question just to make sure, make sure I don't uh, get it wrong here, Neil. Uh, recently, you were on the exchange on CNBC saying the stock market's not overvalued. Correct. And you talked about Lyft's IPO and... Um, you compared it to Pets.com back in 2000, saying that Lyft actually has a product, whereas Pets.com really didn't. Uh, and you said, but you said you wouldn't invest in Lyft because they lost a billion dollars in their most recent filing. Um, I was just curious if you could talk a little bit more about that and why you think those two things are different and more about the market at large right now. Well, Pets.com had a product. The difference with uh, uh, Lyft and, and say Pets.com was pets.com. I don't know what selling pet food has to do with technology. Because if, but it was just you put a dot com next to it and everybody thought it was a tech company. It wasn't. It was just dog and cat food and, and, and bones and, and, and bowls and stuff. And, and back in the late 90s, what was happening, companies were coming public and they were raising 500, 600, 700 million dollars going public and the stocks would go from 20 to 40 and they had no product. They didn't have anything. They had no revenues. They had no product. 
and they spent all the money. And that's when the euphoria came into the marketplace in the late 90s. And you saw in 1999, the NASDAQ, which is pretty much uh, what you would call the tech, uh, tech arena, was up 86% in 1999 alone. It was just euphoria. Everybody was talking about how you get wealthy. It's a dot com. In today's world that they're going pu public with is their late stage. But you, you look at it, they have a real life product. So you can look at Lyft, you can look at Uber. They, they have revenue, there's no doubt. And it's not a bad business plan. In fact, it's a very good business plan going forward, but they're still losing a billion dollars. Now, if you're losing a billion dollars, you know, after a billion here, a billion there, it starts to add up to being real money. But they can get out of that into the future. But I'd rather buy into a profitable company I'd rather buy into a company that has a, a low price to sales ratio. So for instance, one of the criteria that I'd learned in buying equities years ago was 40 years ago is the price to sales ratio. You buy off, you don't buy off the PE ratio. And the reason you want to look at the price of sales and not PE is just like the real world. You, you get 1099 you know, for your earnings that year, and then you make a decision, do I want to take a loss on the stock or this or that? So you can manipulate your earnings to a certain extent legally to either up your earnings or lower your earnings, and companies do the same thing. But your gross is your gross. So your sales are your sales, unless you're going to cook the books like Enron did. So it's a truer number. So essentially, when I started in the business uh, 40 years ago, the price of sales cutoff ratio was $1. So we wouldn't pay more than a dollar for a dollar in revenue. So essentially when you, uh, today we use 1.5, so we're not going to pay more than a dollar 50 for a dollar in revenue. So if a company is doing $10 million in revenues, we would not buy the whole company for more than 15 million. Now the real question is you look at these companies and say, okay, here's a company doing 10 million in revenue. And are you willing to pay $250 million for 10 million in revenue? Or would you rather pay 15 million for 10 million? So that's why I say about being conservative. There's a big difference between growth, which when you look about growth and they talk about a company that has growth, what you're essentially doing is investing in something that might or might not happen in the future. You buy um, Casey's uh, General Stores, which is, you know, a Midwest gas station convenience store operator in, in, in communities of 5,000 people or less. And they, they got the corner. They're there. They're highly profitable. They pay a dividend. They can raise their dividend. There's so much they can do. Whereas you look at a, a, a Lyft or an Uber, it's going to be a long, long time before they have retained earnings in order to even pay or a, a dividend, because that's all you can do is pay it out of retained earnings. So essentially, we look for companies that are solid in making money. And you think that the situation now is, is different from the 1999, 2000, early 2000s situation, because uh, you mentioned people are employed? Well, I think, in today's market, everybody's saying, well, the market's at 26, 27,000. You know, it's been up since 2009. But you have to look back in, 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 in time. And, and uh, uh, one of the biggest things that you find out about the stock market or any kind of bubble that you see out there is you got to wait for the euphoria to set in. So if you go back into the mid 80s, the euphoria was, oh, you're too young, Jeff, but uh, Dave remembers in the mid 80s, it was all real estate. You had to get in real estate. That's how you made your money. And, and, and then that was it. And then all of a sudden, real estate collapsed at the end of the uh, 80s, early 90s. And the RTC had to come in uh, to help bail people out. Then you look at the, going back to the 90s and we had the euphoria. Everybody was talking at every dinner party and cocktail party was talking about the dot com. And that's where you had to invest. You had to invest in the dot com. And like I said earlier, then the market fell apart in 2001 and 02, where the market lost 40 percent of its value. We were fortunate. Our, our clients did not. They, they essentially made money, to be honest with you, or broke even. But 
essentially the euphoria was there. Then, as they say, history tends to repeat itself. And essentially, you look at go into 2006, 7, 8, you go to a cocktail party or whatever, everybody was talking about real estate. You had to get in real estate. That's where you make your money. And it was a euphoria. So you knew that was going to bust. And so when it did break, Jeff, I mean, it broke hard. I mean, the business stock construction stopped in a day. And the market in October of 08, you know, went started to go south big time. But at the time, and, and it's still in the headlines, how the taxpayers um, bailed out the banks. And that's, that's not entirely true to say, in, in my opinion, not even close to the truth because you know, when you, when you look back um, at the banks in 2008, just ask yourself, did you have a problem cashing a check? Did you have a problem going to a bank and getting cash? Will you use your credit card? Could you do this or that? The banks were open doing business. What it was, was when John Thane at Merrill Lynch th sold all of his mortgage paper at 21 cents on the dollar, every other bank, everybody had to mark their paper to 21 cents on the dollars which meant that you were out of compliance, that you didn't have the capital anymore. The reality was they had the cash, they had the capital. And so what, what got us out of the mess was when uh, uh, the, the legislators and, and the regulators started to say that, hey, okay, you can, management can have a say in what they think their papers were. It's not worth 100 cents on the dollar, but we know it's not worth 21 cents. So if you get back to 60 cents, now they're back in compliance and everything ended on March, of 09. But in that time frame, everything went south. So essentially, the market went from 14,000 to 6,400. It should have maybe gone from 14,000 to 12,000. Certainly not 6,400, but that was the liquidity for people. People were losing equity in their homes. They saw their account that was a million dollars. All of a sudden, now it's 500,000. They're seeing their house that they thought was a million dollars that was always safe and that was going to go to the kids. Now that's worth 600,000, it just imploded. But that was all because of euphoria. I don't see any, anything um, euphoric about this market, nothing. Nobody, you don't go to a cocktail party and people are talking about stocks or real estate. I don't see anything out there except maybe Bitcoin. I was gonna get to that. Yeah, <laughs> <Here's your word. laughs> yeah. I, was, I haven't got to that yet. I was just curious. For the layman out there like me that, that doesn't really understand what you're talking about, uh, pricing a, a bank or Lehman Brothers pricing their, their paper at 21 cents, can you explain the mechanics of that just really quick? Well, uh, essentially, you, you take out um, a mortgage for a million dollars, right? So, and you're paying your mortgage on, you know, a monthly principal and interest. And somebody takes your mortgage, say Merrill Lynch, takes it and sells it to somebody else for $210,000. You still owe on a million dollars, but somebody just bought it for $210,000, right? Right. They own it. So everybody else piece of paper in that marketplace has to be marked at $210,000 or 21 cents on the dollars. When you look at it, now you're out of capital from, from an accounting standpoint. But you, Jeff, are still paying your principal and interest on time. Now, there were a lot of people that were not paying their principal and interest on time, but it certainly wasn't, you know, 79% uh, of the people right. were paying their mortgages. And that's essentially what, what the marketplace was, was saying when John Thane um, ended up selling all of his paper. So it cut the legs out from uh, under everybody. But that's essentially how that game worked. Gotcha. Okay. And the second thing I wanted to ask was about the, um, how talking about the bailout of the banks, the, the banks, a lot of the bailouts, uh, from, from TARP to the auto bailouts, a lot of those were loans that were, that were paid back. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? Well, yeah, no, the banks paid. Here's the interesting part is the banks paid back, you know, uh, I forget what the number was. It had come to me, you know, $750 billion or whatever, $250 billion, it might have been the number that the banks paid back to the government plus interest, plus all their warrants on the stocks and everything like that. The tax mayor payers made a tremendous amount of money with the exception, there are a couple of exceptions, one being General Motors. 
General Motors didn't pay back the taxpayers. But, you know, that's okay. That's a union. That's a whole different deal. Forget about it. The banks are, are greedy pigs. So, but they're the one that taxpayers, you know, got all their money back and more with the warrants that the taxpayers made out, you know, very, very, very well. And that was all in a year. So if you're talking about $250 billion, which was the number they paid back within a year, year and a half, and that's net after tax. So essentially, I don't think they were broke if you can make that kind of money in a heartbeat. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I hear, I hear people uh, throughout the political persuasion is talking about, you know, they should have given that money to the people that were suffering. And then I, you know, when, not, when you really think about the situation, it's like, would the people have paid it back with interest? Well, it's not really, I, I mean, you're talking about, I, I understand some people that just had their own house and, and they did get fleeced. If you want to use the word fleece by not really understanding what they were signing. And, and when they were, you know, uh, redoing their mortgages or whatever, and have this arm, there were people that truly did not understand and got hurt. But, you know, I have no sympathy for the people that were just out there speculating, not putting anything down, didn't really care, knew you look at the papers, knew they weren't making a half a million dollars a year, knew it was all falsified and they're buying, you know, they own five, six, seven, ten homes. And then they just throw up their hands and say, well, this was fraudulent. It, it wasn't fraudulent. These people were just greedy and it came back to hit them. And that's the same if you look at it, same thing that happened back in the late 90s where all these uh, tech people uh, exercised their options and held on to them, right? And they borrowed money to buy the stock because it was never going to end. And then the market went south and they lost all the money and they owed the government the taxes and they owed the banks the money. And then they were, they were crying and whining. Well, they're the ones that leveraged. They were just being greedy. I mean, bulls get some, bears get some, pigs get none. <laughs> Actually, we said it the way we said it on the Florida Stock Exchange was: bulls make money, bears make money, pigs go broke. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> I thought it was pigs get slaughtered. Yeah, could be that too. Oh, that's, a lot of uh, that's another version that I think is online. Pigs get a raw deal. That's all we're trying to say, right? <laughs> pigs, oh, yeah, pigs or, never get no respect. Or well, right. or they they uh, they I think their own ruin. Yeah, I, I, I think in the in the real world, people cause their own problems, you know, and, and uh, they cause it because, especially in the financial industry, because they let their emotions get involved in their investment, investment making decision process. And if you, you think about it, um, if, if emotions enter an argument, at some point in time, it's going to get ugly. We've all been there. I'm Irish. It's obviously a lot more than most people. But essentially, the same thing happens in investing. You let emotions get involved with your decision-making process, and it's going to get ugly at some point in time. Yeah, definitely. You mentioned Bitcoin. I was curious what you think about that as well. I have, you know, Jeff, I have no idea how that works, okay? I, I don't understand <laughs> it. Uh, I've tried to understand it. What I do know about it is I read all the time how there's somebody's um, uh, Bitcoin is being stolen and it's $100 million or $40 million or $50 million and they're being stolen and, and it just disappears. And I go, well, how's, how's it just disappear? Where'd it go? Nobody knows. So, I mean, when you start to think about that, that, um, you know, it just disappears, why would you want to get involved in a market like that? It doesn't make any sense to me. And so as much as people say, well, it's going to be a virtual currency or this or that, you essentially have it now if you pay your bills online and you have the money in your account. So, you know, this was really brought out apparently for, you know, the unscrupulous people or nefarious people or, that didn't want anything recorded or about, you know, and it could have been drugs. It could have been whatever it is, but uh, that's why the, the, the currency came out essentially. But I, I still can't, I, I've read articles where somebody lost $500 million. I'm going, huh? This is a fair amount of money to lose out of your account. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm not a big, I, I, I don't see any use for it, but maybe it's because I'm 63 and I'm not as young as you, Jeff, then maybe you see something I don't. <laughs> 
No, I don't, I don't know what to think of it either. We had an employee working for us that was completely gung ho about it. And, uh, that was before it rose in price. So I wish him the best. I hope he made a lot of money. Yep. <laughs> I, I don't know much about it. Otherwise, otherwise you mentioned, uh, the government policy landscape and how during the previous administration, it, there may have been more re- regulations and during the current administration, has there been a lot of that? Uh, has, has there been a big shift? Well, it, under the previous administration, President Obama and, and the legislative bodies, uh, we, you know, just thought rules and regulations were the best thing ever and just kept putting them in. And, and uh, you know, it's sort of like the when you look at what the Department of Labor uh, did at the end, which is a suitability room rule, which they then called the fiduciary rule because the SEC wasn't dealing with it, you know, as a registered investment advisor or stockbroker. See, we have we have a suitability rules, which really takes care of that. In other words, the rules in, in, in our industry at the time of the recommendation, was it suitable in light of their total financial situation? And that really is a fiduciary rule. If it wasn't, you go to arbitration, you go to court and you win it and it was all taken care of. But they really wanted a fiduciary rule in there where they mainly could get into federal court quicker. And so although the SEC wasn't taking it up, the the President Obama's administration went through the Department of Labor and tried to force through this fiduciary rule uh, which is really a, a, a legal legal standard, and, and how do you how do you come up to that? I mean, it's really we're putting rules. They were putting rules and regulations in, like you were going to stop crime. It, it, the bad guys are going to be the bad guys. I don't care how much you do. It, I mean, it's the same as gun legislation. Take everybody, take all the gun. Right? Okay, bring them all in. I guarantee you the bad guys are going to still have the guns. You're not going to get them all. So essentially, when they were making rules and regulations, especially in our industry, um, you you look at the 2000 and say, I think it was 15 or 16, Mary Jo White's budget at the SEC was $1.6 billion. And they handed out fines that year of $4.3 billion. They weren't there to make the industry better. They were just there to find people to put rules, regulations in. And it really hampered hampered, uh, not only the securities industry, but it hampered a lot of other industries. We were, we were all in the same boat. It was more about finding people, not finding the best solution to the situation. That has changed with this administration. We haven't been able to take regulations off the books, but we haven't added new regulations to any great extent. And so that's, that's you know, been good to say the least. In my yeah. opinion. That's- that does sound like a, a better situation the way you describe it. It sounds like they were trying to implement preventative measures and when there was punitive measures already in place. Right. So, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, so you've been very successful with Tennessee advisors, Tennessee funds, and a lot of that has transferred into some philanthropy efforts. So I was hoping you could discuss some of the uh, charitable relationships you guys have with local schools, sports, uh, other nonprofits. And uh, it seems like one particular sponsorship uh, is uh, important to you. That's of Okizu. Oh, am I saying it right? Okizu. Yeah, we, we, you know, we've been fortunate here and, and not only do, um, you know, people give their time, um, but when you, when you only have 19 doing what we try here, time, time's a valuable commodity. Um, and so what we try and do is you try and support through dollars, although we do do a lot time wise, uh, but we're, we're more or less trying to get funnel the money to where people need it. Um, and I think we give to approximately 150 to 175 different charities a year. Uh, but we wow. cannot be the, 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 uh, table sponsor uh, or, you know, of, or the benefactor for everybody. Um, and, and so years ago, you know, I got involved with an organization called Okaizu. And Okaizu is a camp for kids with cancer. And it was started to bring the kids to camp 
so that they could enjoy camping like other kids did, the swimming, the archery, the boating, you name it, the fishing, the stories, the campfires, the marshmallows, everything like that. And the concept was very simple that you could not pay to go to the camp. We take everybody free and we raise the money every year. And in, it, in, in our first oncology camp that we had, consisted of, I think, about 15 kids and, and, and 11 uh, staff. Um, and, and, it's, and it's grown from there, but the concept was very simple from the standpoint, bringing these kids together into a, an outdoor environment and the doctors for, and nurses from UC and Stanford are there on staff because you still have to have your treatments, but the kids could talk among themselves at the same time enjoy themselves, but they would talk about the treatments and the painfulness and the operations and, and losing an arm, losing a limb, losing your hair, losing your teeth. And, and they could talk about it and, and, and feel comfortable because they weren't the outsider anymore. At school, when you're missing an arm or your teeth or your hair, you know, you're, you're to a certain extent an outsider. Here, everybody was the same. And they, yes, and they could talk about even the fear of dying. And from there, we learned that families needed to come together too, because when you you hear those four words, what the worst any parent wants to hear, which is your child has cancer. You, you feel right out of the chute, you're on an island by yourself. There is nothing, nobody's in the same boat as you, and that's not true. So we put together a family camp where we could bring the parents together so that they could talk about the pain and the trials and tribulations of having a child with cancer and what they're going through and be able to talk about it and realize that they're not on an island by themselves. And yes, they could also talk about the fear of losing a child to cancer. And from there, we realized that, you know, when you have a sick child, the focus of the parents, and it's just natural, is all focused on the sick child. And, and the siblings get left out. You don't mean to leave them out, but you're, you're just focused on the sick child. And so, you know, it's, it's very upsetting to the, the, the siblings. So we started a siblings camp so that we could bring the kids together that they could talk about their little brothers and sisters or older brothers and sisters that have gone through these, these very difficult surgeries and, and the treatments that they're doing now and, and, and be able to talk and cry and, yes, talk about the fear of losing a brother or a sister, the cancer. And then from there, we realize that just because you turn 18 doesn't mean that cancer leaves your body. So we started at teens and 20. So once you're 18, you can come to the teens and 20 camp and be able to talk about your, your aspirations and where you want to go to college and what do you want to do and what profession do you want to major in and, and, and talk all about it together as they're still going through all these painful treatments and surgeries and diagnosis. And, um, and yes, talking about will they be able to live – long enough to fulfill their dream. And then our last camp, which is very, very sad, is, you know, is our bereavement camp. And, and, and that's because sometimes cancer wins. And, and we do all this um, free. We raise all the money. We serviced uh, last year about 3,500 people with 900 volunteers, of which one third were former campers with a full time staff of 10 people. So the organization is as tight as Hennessy Advisors is, but it gives the family a break. It gives the children an opportunity to enjoy themselves, and it fulfills a dream that they get to come back the next year. And so that's our number one um, um, charity. And uh, it's and it wouldn't work if it would, wasn't for the 900 volunteers that come and and uh, and put this all together for us. So that's our major. That's our major uh, uh, charity. I think that's awesome. 
that you do that. I mean, one of the things uh, we teach is connecting your employees to meaningful work and choosing a charity, a cause that you can get behind that everybody on your organization can uh, support and, and enjoy. So I think, I think that's very meaningful, Neil. Nice job. Yeah. We, uh, we've been fortunate. The, the unfortunate, uh, um, uh, part of Okaizu is we've been widely successful, but it just keeps growing, you know, and, and I'd rather see it shrink, but till we get, you know, you know, cures for it, it just keeps growing. And that's the sad part, but it's also a happy part, you know, that the kids, uh, the kids, uh, get to be around their peers. So that, and it's cool. You should see it when you, if you go to camp and, which is uh, above Lake Orville, you go up there, we have 550 acres and you walk around and, and the kids will say, thank you. They don't know who you are. They don't know if you're a donor or not a donor or a potential donor or whatever, but you're not a counselor. You're not there. So why are you there? And they just say, thank you. It's, it's just, I mean, it's really heartwarming, you know, to see something like that. That's awesome. That's, that's pretty much, uh, uh, it for me, unless you you guys have more questions or anything. No, no, we know you're on a tight time schedule too. So thanks for stretching this out a little bit. Really appreciate it, Neil. It's been great to catch up, and I'm sure our audience. So if our audience wants to learn more about uh, you and your organization, where do they go? They just phone Hennessy Funds, Hennessy, and and uh, somebody to answer the phone and get them in the right direction. Or they go to the, you know, they just, they can go to their registered investment advisor, uh, which primarily everybody's using. They're not going direct as much as they used to 20 years ago. So, you know, if you want to inquire about Hennessy Advisors, a publicly traded company or Hennessy Funds, just ask your RIA to, to research it for you. And, and they can phone us or you can phone us or however you want to do it. Fairly, sun. it's like the cognac. It's just, you know, we're not part of that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, Neil. Thanks so much for joining us. All right. Thank you guys for having me on. It was a blast. Thanks, Neil. 